As I mentioned before, this, this biblical um, narrative takes place in the town of Athens. And Athens, um, at that time, was still the cultural capital of the world. The Romans had actually um, taken over the power base, and it was where wars were made and won. But Athens still retained the, the kind of the title of cultural capital. Um, Alexandria in Egypt was kind of the educational capital, and um, Athens was kind of where the philosophers came and where culture got, their, got its tone from. And so Paul happens to be cruising through Athens, and he looks and he sees all kinds of, of statues that have little inscriptions, and they say on them the name of the, the god and the goddess, and he would stand around and talk in the marketplace, and he would learn what these, these gods and goddesses were all about. And he even found one that didn't even have a name. And he's like, what's that all about? And he used that to God's glory. If you had a list from A to Z of all of the gods that were present in that time in Athens, you would have had a list that included Aphrodite, Aphrodite was the goddess of beauty and love and desire and pleasure. You would have had Apollo. Apollo was the god of music and the arts and poetry. You would have seen the god Ares, and Ares was a mighty warrior, and you would pray to Ares before you went off to war, and he was kind of the power seat. And all of these gods were there. You would have Athena, who was a god of wisdom and intelligence and reason. It's interesting that a woman was the... Anyway, never mind. God of intelligence and wisdom. You would have had Bacchus, who was the, the, the god of the parties, um, or the fraternity god. Um, he was the, the one who was the god over wine and drunkenness. You would have had Hermes, who was the god of travel and who you prayed to for safe travel when you were going here and there. And finally, down through the alphabet, you would have come across Zeus, and Zeus was the god of gods, the king of all the gods, and he's the one who brought justice to the planet. And Paul saw these things, and he was greatly distressed, the Bible says. And the word that is used there for greatly distressed, the Greek word para something or other that I can't really pronounce off the top of my head, but it, the, the English translation of that word is the word seizure. Paul was so in our language, we say greatly distressed, but he was so upset that it was like he was having a seizure. He was super intense that these guys were on a bad path. And that word that's used there that, me, that kind of references seizures, it, in the Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament got translated, the Old Testament got translated into Greek, and every time that that word appears in the Old Testament, it has to do with God's holy jealousy. Think about this for a second. Your kid is headed down a path and you see where it's going and you're heartbroken. There's a holy jealousy that you want to restore. That's the feeling Paul had when these people were walking around and thinking these statues were going to be the thing that made them right with, for eternity. He's like, no! He couldn't handle that. He was like, he was so intense about the nature of this feeling that he just wanted to scream and yet, at the same time, it said in the reading that he met with them every day in the, in the marketplace, and they even invited him to the, to the pinnacle, to the Washington, D.C. think tank. That's basically what the Areopagus was. It was the place where all the philosophers went, and they tried to work out their philosophies. Because in those days, they didn't have blogs and social media and stuff. So you know what you did when you were trying to work out your philosophy? You went and talked with the other philosophers, and so they invite Paul into the meeting. All the smart guys in the whole world are there. And Paul's talking to them. And they invited him in. And yet he had this almost rage-like thing that he was so jealous for the truth that he was like seizuring. It's probably not a word, seizing. <laughs> but he was, so, he was so intense that, uh, and, and they still let him in. So he must have also been so loving and kind and thoughtful and yet at the same time so holy and righteous and I don't know where you are in this spectrum but I think most of us tend to err on one side or the other of this spectrum that we're kind of we can be really nice 
on this hand, or really firm and speak the truth. But the person who can meld those is pretty rare. We have this basic proclivity, this natural personality that probably is a little bit one or the other. And yet for Paul to do his work, he had to be both and. Why? Why can't we just be nice and get along? Why can't we just tolerate everything that's called truth in the world and say, oh, you do your thing, I'll do mine? Because there's a God who judges. Because there's justice that God is going to bring upon the world. And because Paul had this relationship with the one who had borne that justice. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he said, um, I, I swore to know nothing except the cross of Christ and him crucified. Why is that? Well, because the cross of Christ was that important. You can't just be nice guys and say, oh, let's just all get along, we'll accept everything there is. That's relativism and that doesn't work. But then there's this other side, this highly moralistic, do everything right kind of side of things that that feels like the law and it just strangles the life right out of people. And neither one of them works. Only when you bring the two together in the cross do relationships with the eternal really start to pop. And that's when stuff starts to work. And so how do we become people who can speak the truth and yet also be so gentle that people will listen? If I could bottle that and sell it, (laughs) I don't know the full answer. What I do know is that God calls each of us to be on that journey where we're working that out as we go. That's the journey. That's the challenge. That's the call. That's the opportunity that he gives us because each of us will interact with somebody who needs the gentle side and somebody else who needs to hear reality. They told me in preaching school that your job is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. I don't know where you're at today. (laughs) I don't know if you need afflicting or comforting. I know some of you. I know some of you need comforting. Because I've talked to you recently, yesterday, the day before, this morning, and there's some stuff in your world that's, that's wearing you down and it's beating you up, and it's like, oh, God, I don't know what to do. For you, there's a word of comfort. For you, there's a word of hope. For you, there's a word that Christ is enough. The promise is all things are yes in him. In other words, I got gotcha. you. And for some of us, we're just, ah, just kind of going through the motions and we're doing the church thing and we're like, eh, 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 I'll just show up and do it because I'm supposed to, because my grandma told me to, because my mom told me to, because my husband told me to, my wife told me to. So I'm just here. Guess there's a message of affliction maybe, of like, get real. Let's deal with God, the almighty God, who Paul says isn't made out of stuff that you can make out of your hands, not gold and silver or stone, none of that. He's the God who went and spoke all of creation into being. You don't worship the created, you worship the creator. And that was a new concept to these philosophers. They were like, what? Can we really know the one who created? You mean he's personal, he's alive? Yeah, and he sent his son, his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but would have life everlasting. And he's he's pouring this out. And he gets to the story of the death and resurrection and they... And it gets to resurrection, and they're like, seriously? You think God can bring people back from the dead? Death is permanent. He's like, no. This is a real thing. It's an objective truth. You guys might remember that we talked about the gospel some weeks ago. We talked about the gospel of Marathon, for example. And the gospel of Marathon was there was a, a big battle that took place in, in Marathon. And, they, and the guy, when they won the battle... The uh, Athenian soldier ran from Marathon all the way back to Athens to report the good news of this new reality. We, di- we won the battle. We thought we were going to lose. We're not going to be imprisoned. This is the gospel of the Marathon. The gospel is a new reality that everybody has to deal with. That's what Jesus' gospel is. It's a new reality that everybody has to deal with. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. This is true. This is a fact. This is an objective truth. Deal with it, people. And some of them, when he got to the resurrection, what did it say in the text? They sneered. 
They sneered. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't get their heads around this idea that, that a resurrection could actually happen that was too far for them to go. And so some of them walked away. But some of those even really smart intellectual types from the Areopagus leaned in. And it named a couple of them. Did you see that? Real people who believed the gospel and their lives were transformed because they got this new power that they didn't have access to before because the Bible talks about in Romans chapter six, it says that when you're baptized into Christ, you get a whole new life. A new dimension becomes a reality for you. There's a spiritual reality. You see things that other people don't see. You see the world through new eyes in an eternal way. And so how do we become these people who so hold on to this objective reality and so hold on to this love in such a way that, that people are like drawn in? Even Paul didn't get it 100% of the time. Did you notice that? Most of them sneered and went away. So we, should we be surprised that most people don't respond? No. But that's our job, to hold out the word of life, right? Right? to hold out the word of life so that people are drawn in. We're not going to bat 100%, but I guarantee you this, if we're milk toasty and we're, oh, you accept whatever you want, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, zero people are going to come to know him. If we try and do what the culture says is culturally appropriate, uh, don't be too zealous. Moderate. Moderate never saved anybody. It did not. And so we need to be people say, don't be, don't be too fanatical. I think we're not fanatical enough. <laughs> fanatical enough that we would speak the truth, that we would speak the truth, the reality that Jesus Christ came to die for this broken planet, make things all right, and we are experiencing the first fruits of that. In just a minute. Take eat. This is my body. This is my blood. My, my presence, my real presence for you. It renews us. We're experiencing the beginning of the restoration when we come before the Lord's table. That's awesome. It's a miracle. God died for me, and he's feeding me spiritually. He's renewing me now and for eternity unto everlasting life. How do we, how do, we do all of this in such a way that we don't come off like, I don't know, I, I, I think I've mentioned this one other time, um, but there was a survey that came out not too long ago. It said 75% of the people in the United States did not want a fundamentalist Christian as a neighbor. <laughs> Why is that? Because we have this impression that fundamentalist Christians are just mean-spirited and that they're judgmental and they're going to, tell you what for, and you're not cutting your yard right, and you're <laughs> whatever, you know. You drank a beer, you're not going to heaven. <laughs> I don't know what people think, but it, it's interesting. 75% of the people in the U.S. don't want a fundamentalist Christian as a neighbor. What about a Lutheran as a neighbor? I don't know. I don't know what percentage of people want those. I hope it's a lot higher. <laughs> I hope it's a lot higher because we've learned to do this, to love and speak the truth to bring the gospel, and also to bring the law that says there is objective reality, and here's the objective reality. This is the way to life, and all other paths don't end up there. But this is worth fighting for. Um, I'll go back to my notes and remember what I was going to say next. Okay. Um, here's, the, as we kind of wind this down a little bit, um, as I said before, Paul did not have, um, he did not have Facebook, he did not have social media, so how did he go about this? How did he go about this, bringing people into this dynamic relationship and having them think this through? It says he reasoned with them every day. That's all about relationship. He reasoned with them every day means he was in a personal interaction with them on a regular basis. And you can't do that if you're just coming with the heavy hand of saying, you're, you're worshiping false gods over there. You silly people. You can't do that. Now, that may be what is true, but you have to do it in such a way that they're going to want to hear. And so how do we speak the truth in love? How do we help people realize that things like food, clothing, and shelter can very easily become gods? 
They do, right? Even just food, clothing, and shelter. If, you, um, if you're a glutton, that's making, uh, idols are good things turned into ultimate things. If your value in life comes from eating the best foods and you're a gourmet, then you're saying that's the most important thing in my life and if I can't have gourmet food, then I just as soon not even exist. Some, for some, that may be the case, but for some it's probably, well, if I, if I live in this zip code or I go to the right school, then I'm okay, but otherwise I'm not gonna be okay. If I don't get into the college that I wanna get into, I'm not okay. Or for some, it might be um, GPA, class rank, body shape, whatever. Acceptance by the right people. John Newton um, was the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. He was a slave trader turned preacher, and he would tell young couples, he said, the enemy of a good marriage is a great marriage. He would say, because you're going to turn your spouse into an idol. You think that all of your needs can be met by your spouse. They cannot. Only God can meet all your needs. And if you put that burden upon your spouse, you're going to ruin your relationship. The enemy of a good marriage is a great marriage. Your marriage can become an idol. Your kids can become an idol. Anything can become an idol. Any good thing can be an idol. How do we help people see that? How do we see it ourselves? Well, We keep going to his word so that we understand that he alone is primary and everything else is secondary. So he had these personal interactions where he would meet with them. Then he had this power of persuasion. Why? Because he hung on the cross. He held on to the cross. He trusted in Jesus Christ alone. And he had this conviction. So Paul had these personal interactions. He had this ability to persuade because he was so passionate as I said, he was deeply distressed. He was almost in seizures as he was thinking about the fact that these folks were not getting reality. That was his conviction. My prayer for each of us today is that we would have this healthy dose of truth and love, law and gospel, sweetness and thunder, that we, that we speak reality and that we bring people into the kingdom. We share the objective truth And we also share his objective love that only comes through Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, in your kindness, you you brought people into the kingdom in Athens, even all these really smart intellectuals. Some of them heard. Some of them got it. Lord, may we be your instruments like Paul was, heralds of the good news, heralds of a new reality. Maybe we do use Facebook and blogs and social media to let this word out. But give us some real life people with flesh on that we could be Jesus to them as well. We ask it in his holy name because he died that we might live. And all of God's people said, amen. Would you please stand and join me as we uh, speak the Apostles' Creed together. Summary of what the Bible teaches about our triune God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.